These are six of the most ambitious prints I've attempted with the Snapmaker U1 tool changer. And one bonus one, ranging from single color, single material to multicolor and multi material. I've been able to produce some seriously cool prints with this thing, but it wasn't always smooth sailing. And we got off to a pretty rough start. Let me show you what I mean. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got here. Well, it all started here. No, not there. Go back a little further. No, no, too far. Right, there, stop. Perfect. This is the moment I learned that my Snapmaker U1 was dead on arrival. This is when I discovered the root cause. And this is when I was able to finally resolve the issue. It turns out that there was a short in the toolhead hub PCB. During troubleshooting, I inadvertently caused a voltage surge that fried some components on the motherboard. While certainly a disappointing start to my experience with this printer, it did give me the unique opportunity to evaluate its repairability, which is an often overlooked but very important aspect of a 3D printer. I covered that in this video, so check that out if you haven't seen it. Snapmaker support were very helpful in getting the issue sorted out. Now of course, that isn't necessarily a reflection of how good the support will be for the 15,000 people that have already backed this machine on Kickstarter, because I'm only one of a handful of people that have this printer right now. But it is good to see that they have their processes in place to assist users in troubleshooting and diagnosing issues. In my case, a replacement motherboard did the trick. I was finally up and running and ready to put this printer through its paces with some torture testing. But we're going to skip the benchmarks and go right to here, a four color PLA print. The benefit of a tool changer is that we don't need to purge filament between color swaps, as is necessary with single nozzle multi-material solutions. The result is a significantly quicker print with far less waste. Filament purging on single nozzle multi-material printers can take the better part of a minute. Multiply that by hundreds or thousands of swaps in a complex print and it adds a lot of time. The U1 takes just 6 to 8 seconds on average to complete a tool change. A small amount of filament is deposited on a prime tower just to get things flowing again. Then it's back to print. This approach blows away the others. But until now, it's come at a cost. A big cost. The Prusa XL with five tool heads will set you back $3,500, or $3,950 if you add the optional enclosure. The U1 is just $749 on Kickstarter right now, with the regular retail price of $999. It's enclosed on four sides from factory, and can be fully enclosed with the addition of a top cover, which also includes a chamber heater. But to the XL's credit, it has one additional toolhead and a considerably larger build volume. Comparing the U1 to a similar size printer, the Bamboo X1C, it's not hard to see how this could be a big market disruptor. For less money, you're getting a slightly larger and considerably more efficient printer. But none of that really matters if the print quality sucks. So let's see how it stacks up. This shoe model completed in 9 hours, with 32 grams of filament wasted on the prime tower. The same model printed on a single nozzle multi-material printer takes 29 hours and wastes 313 grams of filament in purge material. The quality looks really nice. Very good detail reproduction and of course no color bleeding since every color originates from a separate nozzle. I did however have one issue during this print and that was a tool docking failure. During one of the tool changes the tool carrier attempted to dock the tool but was unsuccessful. This failure mode happens occasionally on the Prusa XL too. Somehow the carriage gets slightly out of alignment with the dock, causing the tool not to be picked or placed properly. On the XL, the dock position is manually adjusted as part of the pre-flight commissioning, which can take a while to do for all five tools. On the U1, the dock positions are calibrated from factory. The coordinates are stored in a JSON file in the printer's firmware. I know this because I had to download the file from my old motherboard and upload it to my new one so the dock calibration wasn't lost. The second part of the calibration process for multi-tool printing is the offset identification. This ensures that there are no gaps on the model where two tools meet. The XL uses a pin in the bed to achieve this. You need to install it before initiating the calibration and remove it when it's done. The U1 uses a feature in the bed itself. Over the course of about 5 minutes, each tool probes this point to determine the relative position of the nozzles. And it seems to work just fine, because there are no gaps visible between the colors on this model. With that first success under my belt, I tried a slightly more challenging print, a multicolor and multi-part articulated cap. I first needed to switch out the old filament and load the new ones. One of the big downsides of a tool changer as compared to an AMS is that the filament remains loaded even when it's not in use. On the other hand, AMS filaments can be easily removed and replaced at your convenience. The process of switching filaments on the XL is also quite tedious. You need to heat, 
unload, pull back the old filament, manually feed the new one in, extrude, clean the nozzle, and rinse and repeat for all of the other tools. The U1 has motors to assist with getting the filament to the tool head. From here, it's just about as tedious as the XL, or at least it was until the latest firmware update. The process is now mostly automated. You simply need to select which tools you'd like to load, assign the filament type and color on screen, and the printer will do the rest. It will heat, extrude, wipe, and rinse and repeat until all tools are loaded. The process is similar for unloading, except in that case, you will need to manually pull back the filament. It would be nice if the filament loading motors could just be run in reverse to re-spool, but it turns out that these only have a single motor that is shared between both inputs. If it turns one way, it loads input one. If it turns the other way, it loads input two. So there's no way it could be used for unloading too. Assigning filament types on the screen doesn't just inform the preheat temperature. It also reports that information back to the slicer for use when preparing your prints. The XL also keeps track of the filament type in each input, but not the color. So you'll need to remember to update the machine profile in the slicer each time you change filaments. For slicing, the U1 uses an Orca slicer fork, Snapmaker Orca, that has some extra layers of functionality specific to this printer. But instead of just maintaining their own separate branch of the slicer, Snapmaker is also pushing their changes back to mainline Orca, which is really nice to see. All right, let's see how this print turned out. The small parts on the cow's tail were a good test for bed adhesion. And at first, they didn't pass. Some of the sections came detached. A little bit of glue stick and we were back up and running. One negative attribute of this printer's design is the poor visibility of the first layer. The best vantage point is from the back of the printer, looking through the rear acrylic. The addition of this viewing window is a welcome improvement over the solid backs of most printers, but in most cases, this would be butted up against a wall. The visibility from the front is obscured by this cross member. The XL, with its cantilevered Y-axis, provides an unobscured view from the front, so points here definitely go to Prusa. This time, the print completed successfully. A little bit of assembly, and wow, that's a nice looking print. The same model printed on an X1C would take 28 hours and waste 193 grams of filament. The prime tower for this model was only 25 grams, and the print took just over 9 hours to complete. With Multicolor mastered, it's time to level up and try some multi-material prints. How about PTG and TPU? I printed all of these parts simultaneously, but it took a few tries to get it right. At first, I couldn't even get the TPU to load. It was escaping from the drive gears. Then I remembered a trick from the days of printing TPU on the Prusa Mark III. Reducing idler tension can help prevent the filament from getting squished too much and wrapping around the gears. Fortunately, the U1, like the Mark III, has an easily accessible adjustment screw for the idler. The same isn't true of every printer. Some are difficult or impossible to access, so this is a positive. But a well-designed extruder will have sufficient tension for a range of materials, from rigid to flexible, without the need for manual adjustment. I've never needed to adjust it on the XL. So I'm glad we can adjust it if necessary, but I'd rather we didn't have to. At any rate, we were ready to do some TPU printing. The filament I'm using is Morflex from BQ. It's a 90A TPU on the spool, but after printing, it has an effective shore hardness of 75A. Results here look pretty good across the board. A paw print keychain with a soft pad and rigid exterior. A massage tool with a soft gripper and roller. A clothespin, albeit too compliant to be functional. And a doorstop with a solid core and a compliant exterior. I was very pleased with the quality of the extrusion for both TPU and PTG. There was, however, some stringing between the prints that detracted from the final part quality, particularly on the clothespin, where the TPU strings contaminated the PTG layers, and on the doorstop, where the seam line is quite rough. The PTG parts of the print looked clean, with smooth extrusion and no noticeable VFAs or other artifacts. Having gotten a grip on TPU, I decided to up the ante and print something I was fairly certain would fail, a sweeper set in PLA with TPU bristles. The large flat surface of the dustpan made this a good test of bed flatness. As the first layer went down, I could tell it was too close, so I looked for an option to baby step on screen, which unfortunately didn't exist, so I resorted to the web interface to make that adjustment. Looking at the mesh result, we can see that the bed is very poorly level, and here's why. After overcoming my initial troubles with the electronics, I encountered another major issue. The bed was loose on its mounts, allowing it to slide back and forth. In order to fix it, I had to do some disassembly, which included loosening the spring-loaded bed screws. 
I was able to tighten up all of the mounting screws but one. The hole on the plastic bracket was stripped. This really doesn't inspire much confidence. I want to be able to crank these all down, but if the brackets get stripped completely, they'll be ruined. I did verify that Bamboo does it the same way on their printers. They tap the plastic directly, but I'd much prefer if there were some threaded inserts here so the holes couldn't be stripped. During reassembly, I did my best to tighten the spring nuts by the same amount so the bed would be level, but I clearly didn't do a very good job, as you can see from the mesh. I considered adjusting it, but I decided instead just to try a print and see how it did. And honestly, it was fine. The first layer went down well on the second attempt of the dustpan. I'd say this is one of those instances of what you don't know won't hurt you. The U1 runs Clipper, so I have the option of viewing the bed mesh and seeing how badly leveled it really is. But in the absence of that knowledge, I wouldn't identify any issues, since the firmware does a good enough job of compensating. For all I know, my bamboo beds might be just as bad or worse. But without the data to back that up, I'm just looking for a good enough first layer, which I almost always get. The more challenging part of this print was the bristles. They're tall and thin, which makes this a retraction torture test. To my surprise, they printed just fine. Some fine stringing between them, which is to be expected. But overall, I'm very happy with the quality of this print. Now I can clean up all of the filament poop that's littered on the floor from my single nozzle multi-material printers. So we've gotten a handle on printing with multiple materials. Now let's put that to good use and print something functional. In a previous video, I documented the process of scanning one of the armrests from this airplane and converting the ashtray into a cup holder. I printed the finished piece using a carbon-filled PET. The underside needed some support, which proved to be a headache to remove. The filament sticks very well to itself, so I wanted to try again, this time using a dedicated support material. Things were going well at first, but a short while later, the print paused with an error code on screen, indicating that the filament was tangled. Upon inspection, I could see that the spool had slid off slightly, which must have caused extra resistance, triggering the tangled detection. It resumed okay, but a short while later, we had a bigger problem. The spool had fallen completely off the roll, and the brittle filament got broken in the process. Again, the error detection system did its job, triggering a pause for filament runout detection. Unfortunately, this time it didn't recover as gracefully. The spools falling off the holders was a recurring occurrence throughout my time testing this printer. It's worse with some brands than others. The design of this holder was clearly inspired by the AMS Lite, which I don't recall having this issue, so it seems that something may have been lost in translation. I ended up needing to shim the holders to keep the spools in place, but I'll probably just end up replacing these eventually with something I print myself. In the end, I was able to get a successful print of the armrest. Print quality overall was good. The seam line was quite rough, however, and there seemed to be some vertical fine artifacts on the straight section. I didn't put much effort into building this profile, so it's quite likely that these attributes could be improved with some tuning. Now to the important question, how easy are the supports to remove? I'll show you that in just a minute, but first, let me show you how you can level up your 3D printing skills with today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is the largest online learning community for makers, designers, and creatives. They have courses in a variety of subjects, including design, engineering, and business. If you're just starting out, you might benefit from 3D Printing 101, where they teach you the basics. Then, when you're ready to level up your skills and start designing your own products, take this course on Fusion 360. Or, for organic modeling, try learning Blender. If you decide you'd like to monetize your new skills, there's this course on turning your hobby into a fully-fledged 3D printing business. With thousands of inspiring classes from a range of skilled instructors, Skillshare can help you supercharge your abilities and unlock new potential. The first 500 people to use my link in the description or scan the QR code on screen will receive a one-month free trial of Skillshare. Get started today. All right, let's see how easily these supports come off. Not as easy as I had hoped. I used a zero gap for the interface, which might be best reserved for soluble support material, but it was a fair bit easier to remove than the same material support, and the surface underneath is much smoother. And by the way, in order to print abrasive materials like this with the U1, you'll need to upgrade to hardened hot ends. You can get a four pack for $50. So we have a pretty good handle on dual material prints. Let's throw another into the mix, shall we? The next test was to print a CT scan of a human spine, with PLA for the bones, TPU for the soft tissue, and PTG for the support. The use of PTG as a support material for PLA, or vice versa, is a popular option in multi-material printing, because it's significantly cheaper than using dedicated support materials. 
The trouble, from my experience, is that these two materials don't stick well enough. We want our support material to have a little bit of adhesion, but not too much. PTG and PLA don't stick at all, so using them together will only be viable in some cases, and this didn't seem to be one of them. Mixing materials also presents some other challenges. We need to pick a middle ground for the bed temperature, so all filaments stick. And if they don't adhere at all, the integrity of the prime tower will be compromised, potentially causing print failures. I'd learned this the hard way when testing the Prusa XL, so I preemptively set the prime tower extruder such that it had a shell of PTG with the other filaments deposited within it. I let the print finish, but the result wasn't great. To add to the problems, the TPU was overdue for drying. So I attempted it again with a fresh roll of TPU, and with a dedicated support material that sticks well enough to PLA, but not too well. I also rotated the model 90 degrees so the steep overhangs would get more direct airflow from the auxiliary part cooling fan. This time the result was much better, but still not quite perfect. The PLA extruder is the one that I had previously been using for CFPT and it appears to have a partial clock, resulting in intermittent under-extrusion. Or at least, so I thought. I swapped in a new hot end and printed again, but the same issue occurred in the exact same locations. I'm honestly not sure how to explain this, but subsequent prints I've done haven't shown this issue again, so I'm going to hope it's an isolated issue. Now for the bonus model. Hmm, how'd that get in there? Oh well, I guess you'd better do what it says. In all seriousness though, this model highlights another interesting attribute of the Snapmaker U1. Over the course of this print, there were many pauses during the tool change operations. The firmware employs just-in-time heating to preserve power and prevent oozing of the unused tools. When the tools are parked, they're cooled to around 105 degrees for PTG or 70 for PLA. Shortly before they're to be used again, they'll start heating. Unfortunately, they don't always finish heating in time, forcing the printer to wait until it's up to temperature. If it takes too long, the firmware will throw an error requiring user intervention. This is definitely something that will need to be addressed. But otherwise, a pretty nice result on this dual color PTG print. So that concludes my testing of the Snapmaker U1. Overall, I'm very impressed. I did some similar tests on the Prusa XL and had a much more difficult time getting passable results. A lot of the issues I experienced back then have been resolved now through firmware and hardware updates. But I didn't sign up to be a beta tester. I was a paying customer. In the case of the U1, I'm a willing participant in the beta program, so I expected it to be rough around the edges, and it definitely is in a few ways. But it also shows a lot of potential, and at the price, I personally feel it's a really good value. Accounting for the existence of the U1, it's going to be hard to justify what the market is currently charging for a single nozzle multi-material printer. But I'd love to know what you think. Did you get in on the Kickstarter, or are you holding out for something else? The Bamboo H2C perhaps? or a Prusa XL version 2 with index? Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching. My name's Taylor, this is YGK3D, and until next time, happy 3D printing.